Welcome to the Wellness Hub Podcast, a show dedicated to uncovering the future of healthy living. Each week, we aim to bring you content that supports your personal health journey through insightful conversations with amazing guests. We explore various topics ranging from healthy eating, technology, fitness, mindfulness, and more. Now let's join our host, Drew Mumro, co-founder and CEO of Up Meals a Vancouver-based food tech startup on a mission to make healthy meals accessible through technology. Hello and welcome to the Wellness Hub. As always, we're thrilled to have you with us for yet another edition of Wellness Wednesday. Every single week, we're hosting amazing guests discussing important topics ranging from entrepreneurship and technology to health, wellness, fitness, and mindfulness. And as always, we hope you find these conversations valuable and insightful on your own wellness journeys. Our special guest tonight is a talented and renowned local chef who's been a prolific part of the Vancouver culinary scene for over 20 years. His culinary exploits have taken him from culinary school in Victoria to working at a three Michelin star restaurant in the Napa Valley to finally Vancouver, where he launched several successful trailblazing restaurants over the years and was actually named chef of the year in 2009. And I'm so excited for this conversation tonight because not only has he always been a staunch advocate of the farm to table concept but also a passionate activist when it comes to improving conditions in the hospitality industry so tonight we'll be diving deep with him to understand how has the vancouver food industry evolved over the years what life lessons has he learned in the kitchen and what changes need to be made in the hospitality industry and why it should matter to everyone from chefs to patrons our guest tonight is the former president of Chef's Table Society and has helped launch Cook's Camp, an industry conference which took place virtually just last week that hosted important conversations on topics like sustainability in the food industry, mental health, business development, and finding work-life balance. Next year's conference will be a one-of-a-kind retreat for chefs that will feature hands-on learning, workshops, keynote speakers, and more, all cum culminating in a celebratory dinner in the natural beauty of North Arm Farm. And a reminder, as we discuss these important topics, as always, please comment with your questions on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, wherever you happen to be watching tonight. We will be answering audience questions all throughout the show, and we'd absolutely love to hear from you. So without further ado, please welcome our special guest this evening, Robert Belcham. Robert, welcome to the Wellness Hub. Thank you, Drew. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So Robert, I want to I wanna go way, way back at the start here of our conversation. And I, I want to know if you remember, what was your first formative kitchen or cooking experience? Where did that love and passion of food come from? That's, I mean, this is, that's a great question. Um, uh, food wasn't a big deal in my family. Uh, it was just sort of a a thing that we, you know, you, you just did it to eat, you know, for mm. fuel. It wasn't really a, a cultural thing or a, mm. anything like that. So, and my mom hated to cook. So when I first discovered, I, 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 I would watch TV like crazy when I was a kid. And when I first discovered PBS and all the great cooking shows on PBS, you know, on a Sunday afternoon, you know, Justin Wilson and the Frugal Gourmet and Julia Child, Jacques mm. Lepin, things like that. Um, it was like I was just this whole world opened up to me, and I was like, "What the hell is going on? What is all mm. this interesting food? What is all this delicious looking food?" Mm. That's what made me start to cook, and I would cook. And uh, my first thing that I ever made was a a, a Creole gumbo, um, wow, from Justin Wilson, and uh, chicken and a chicken and andouille gumbo. And and uh, my my mom hated it, but everybody else really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I kept on cooking. That was when I was, I would think I was 12 at the time when I did that. And wow. I, I never really thought of it as a career until, well, like later, until I was in my early 20s. So your, your first for your first cooking experience and your first critic in the same meal, like you got both of those <laughs> in one, in one shot, right? <laughs> um, exactly. And so, you know, now, now sort of early in your career, like walk me through the next steps. Cause I know you had the amazing opportunity to work as, as chef de partie at the you know, world renowned French laundry restaurant or Thomas Keller. I mean, the cookbook that, you know, got so many professional chefs, myself included in, into professional cooking. Mm -hmm. Ta walk me through that experience, how it came to fruition and, and, and what did you learn from it? Well, I was working at a restaurant on Vancouver Island called the Airy Resort, and it was a Relay Chateau property. Um, we had, you know, we were doing fine dining, tasting menus, that sort of thing. It was all mm -hmm. very local, hyper local. Actually, we had a garden in the back that we picked from every day. We changed the menu every day. 
And I first learned of the French Laundry when I was, re they had a Relais Ch Chateau guide and, and the French Laundry was a, a Relais Gourmand property and part of the Relais Chateau organization. And um, I was quite enamored by it. I, this is before the cookbook came out and oh, I wow. was blown away by it. This is 1999 and, or it could have been 98, I guess. It would have been 98 because um, I was looking for my next opportunity as a cook and, and I was the sous chef at this restaurant and I was thinking about going to Europe or going somewhere to, to learn. And I had sent my resume all around England and France and, and um, I had asked for a, a stage at the French Laundry and my fiance was, was uh, American. She was from Monterey mm. and we were going down there anyway and for a vacation. And, and I asked the chef if I could come and do a stage and he said, sure. Wow. And he, uh, I was down there for two weeks. I spent a week at Bouchon and a week at the French Laundry. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I said, you know, we're, we're thinking about moving here. And he's like, well, when you're, when you're, when you're moved here and you're back, uh, come and look me up and we may have a job for you. Mm. And uh, this is where I first learned that it's always about being at the right place at the right time, because mm. I got home and two days later, Thomas called me and said, if I have a job for you as a butcher, um, I just need you here ASAP. And wow. I'm like, wow. Yes, chef. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> yep. And so we packed up, we sold everything we owned, packed up. We got, we actually got married and we moved everything to Napa. From Victoria, we were living in Victoria at the time. Oh man, crazy! And, and yeah, so th crazy. this was all within how from the time you got home to this happening, it was what you said like a week, two weeks, a, a week. A... Yeah, it wow. Was, yeah, it was. I think it was four or five days. Something. It was really quick. Oh and my just God. because I was top of mind to him and, and yeah. like right person at the right time, he just he had my number like on the the board where they did all the orders <laughs> and stuff. And that's he's like saw it. He's like, we need a butcher. Yeah. Maybe this guy could do yeah. it. Yeah, maybe I how... think maybe you put that post-it note with your number there. I think <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, maybe I'm not going to yeah. say. But yeah, nice, nice. So that's well, how it happened. Yeah. Wow, I'm, I'm amazing, and and you know, kind of then you know, walk me through to the next step because you then had this exciting opportunity where in 2006 to open your own restaurant with with fuel, a really trailblazing concept here in Vancouver at the time. Yeah. You know, talk me through you know what that project was like, what the inspiration was. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Fuel was my baby. I'd been thinking about it, uh, opening a restaurant for, uh, you know, a couple of years. I knew I was ready to open my own place. Um, I had been the chef de cuisine at a restaurant in Vancouver called Sea Restaurant. It was a mm -hmm. seafood restaurant. Um, very well known and, and very, very good quality of, of food and, and had won lots of awards and all sorts of things. And uh, my business partner, Tom Dowdy, was a sommelier at, at sea as well. And so we decided that it was time for us to set out on our own. So we, we, that's exactly what we did. And mm -hmm. it was our dream restaurant. And we didn't set out to be as fine dining, like as fine as it was at sea. And we wanted it to be a little bit more downscale. We were more in the, in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it was, a it, you know, it was eye opening experience, like opening a restaurant, your first restaurant as a business, as a cook, it's, you know, the recipes and the food part of it was actually quite easy. It was the business aspect of it yep. that was this very, very steep yeah. learning curve that you're not really prepared for. And, and you don't really learn about that stuff in this industry, unfortunately, until you are on your own or you have a very, you know, progressive uh, chef that you're working under. Um, I was lucky to have a really good team of people who I worked with. Um, Ted Anderson and Jeff Hopgood and Alvin Pile and Paul Cruto. Like these guys were all, they all could have been chefs at different restaurants in Vancouver at the time. So we had this roster of, of, of a team that was absolutely unbelievable. And at the time, 2007, we cooked, I think we cooked the best food in Canada. Mm. I mean, it was, it was really good. And mm. we, we did it right. And we, the service was on point. The wine list was great. The wine list changed all the time. Um, we, we had a, like a completely open kitchen with a bar at the kitchen. And wow. so we talked to the guests. It was a, it was an amazing time. And the best part was like, because the, the talent pool was so deep at fuel that if I wanted like halfway through service, I could go to Jeff Hopgood. I said like, roast me a roast me a chicken stuff with foie gras. Mm. And, and it would happen. And because he was such a talented cook, I could just, 
and it would be the perfect roasted chicken. Mm. And then I could serve it on a tasting menu. And mm. to be able to have that kind of talent pool behind you when you're trying to cook and create mm. interesting menus and experiences for people was absolutely amazing. And I've never seen another restaurant like that since. Wow. Um, yeah. It was, anyway. it was truly, truly trailblazing for the time. I, absolutely. And I'm sort of seeing this progression of, you know, y you going to the French Laundry, getting, you know, just totally blown away by this um, literal farm to table concept. They have this crazy ecosystem there, you know, and then bringing yeah. that. You're such an advocate of that to this day of this farm to table and this regional cooking. You're so deeply connected to the producers. You know, why should locally sourced food matter to people? And why should they be asking questions about that when they dine? Well, I mean, well, that's a big question, and there's a, there's a, a lot of answers to that question. We ask, we ask the hard hitters here on the wall. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, if you want to, we'll start small and then go big. How about yeah. that? It's like the first the first reason why you want to eat local is because it tastes better. It doesn't have as many food miles on it, so it's fresher and it just tastes better. Um, and it's also because it's the terroir of the of the environment that you're in. So if it's from your own backyard, it's better than them from a carrot down the street, or better than a carrot that's from a farm out in the valley, but so you want to try to, to eat as close to home as possible because it's going to taste better. That's number one. Mm. Number two, it's it's because you're supporting a local your local economy. That's that's huge too. So you have this local economy that you know that supports farmers to be able to grow food. So we have food sources that we're not pulling in food from other provinces or from from like just California or Florida or wherever. And that, that speaks to our own food security, which is incredibly important. And people are talking about that now, especially because of COVID, where a lot of things were, were, were missing off the shelves during COVID at the beginning, especially. Right. And that's how you keep our, um, the, the food security uh, top of mind. And, and you have to be thinking about stuff like that all the time, especially as a chef, because we make decisions on our menus that sort of dictate how the public eats like whether the type of proteins we eat or the, or the styles of food we eat. And um, that's one of the reasons why I've always pushed the idea of eating local. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a super easy concept to think of when you like break it down like that, like it just tastes better. That's yep. that, that's everybody can get behind that. Like you get into the politics of different things or you can get into the, 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 the harder ideas, but if you just start with it tastes better, then people are like, oh, okay, I can get behind that. This is the best answer I've ever heard of that question, right? But it's, it's just, it's so, it's just, it, it's exactly the bottom line of what we're trying to get to is food that is better for us, it tastes better, and, yeah. and of course, better for the environment and better for our local economy. So, yeah, amazing. I, I want to touch on, you know, something that I know you're quite passionate about, and that's about, you know, sort of improving conditions for uh, hospitality workers. Now, you know, I don't know if you, did you hear this story? It was on, you know, on Chef's Table watching the Grant Deschats episode where he was talking about, you know, working for Charlie Trotter in Chicago, like sort of a well-known, sort of very, uh, you know, angry manipulator, <laughs> was sort of a very kind of puppet master, I think, as he described him, right? And then yep. leaving there and going to work where you worked at the French Laundry, and he walks in and there's this, you know, kind man whopping the floors, like leading his staff with like dignity. So, you know, just, I want to talk a little bit, you've built a reputation for sort of keeping your kitchens calm, quiet. It's a bit of a rarity in the industry. You know, uh, talk to me a bit about your methodology and why that's so important for you. Well, I, uh, let's start with the, the, every chef that I've ever worked with has a story of being berated by a sh another of course, chef. Or, of course. Or, and, and I would say that that's, common with any workplace like if you worked at a construction site you you get berated by the by the boss or whatever or at a 7-eleven you get berated by the boss it comes down to bad managers is really what mm -hmm. it comes down to and it's it's industry it's not just in our industry but it's it's everywhere um i decided a long time ago that when i saw like we'll take the french laundry as an example like i saw when i saw us there i saw the chef basically give the nod to the chef de cuisine to take out the uh, a chef de party who was cooking the meat station because he kept on screwing up the, the, the orders for the meat station. The chef de cuisine went over, body slammed him basically against the wall. The guy crumpled to the ground and he crawled offline. And I'm standing there as a stage going like, what in the hell is going on here? Wow. And I'll never forget it. And it was that, that was when I made the decision. It's like, you cannot have, you can't have good food when your cooks are so stressed With out about miserable. making yeah. sure that everything's perfect that they can't 
let the love of the food come through to what they're trying to do on in the pans or and onto the plate. Mm -hmm. So it was super important to me that when I took over kitchen and, and when I did take over the kitchen, that it was very calm, very quiet. It was very um, deliberate and it was just, it, it just, it was a much nicer working environment. Like we, you know, this is the thing we at fuel. We always talk about the days we cooked on carpets. Like we had runner carpets behind the line um, just because it was much nicer to cook on. So we were much more relaxed. I think that's one of the reasons why the food tasted so good. And you, there was never screaming that whole Gordon Ramsay hell's kitchen idea. It, it's just, it's not, it's not really number one, it's for TV. So it's not really true. Of course. Um, but it just, it doesn't, it's not conducive to good tasting food. Mm. Um, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Ask your and grandma. Like when your grandma loves you, so she <laughs> makes you food and she's in a good mood when she's cooking it for you because she's trying to make you feel better. And it tastes awesome because it's your grandma, right? Yeah. It's the same sort of yeah. idea. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely. And I, I, I want to ask you sort of a follow up question because you touched on this where you said, you know, you're thrust into this situation as a manager, a leader, an operator, and you have no training or experience and you're not really set up for success like do you think that's a factor here and why the people that are often put in charge to run kitchens or run you know restaurants often don't have the skills to do it so it results in this toxicity is that a factor 100 percent. i think that's the number one reason is because yeah. of lack of training yeah um you know i never like i was very lucky i you know I had two very important mentors in my career, and one was Thomas Keller. He taught me how to cook and the importance of how, of, of how to season and cooking and all of all the aspects of it. And then I had Robert Clark, who was my chef, mm -hmm. my my executive chef at Sea Restaurant, and he actually taught me how to be a chef. So he taught me how to manage people properly, and I feel very lucky to be able to to, to say that because not very many people have that. They're in our industry because it's so transient. A lot of times the people who are um, the sort of the most capable become the chef because they're the, the, they're the they have the most seniority or they, or they seem just like survive they the longest. Yeah, they exactly. Survive, <laughs> they survive the longest. They seem to know what's going on. Yeah. It doesn't mean they have this actual skills to be the yeah. chef. And that's been a, that's a huge problem in our industry. And it's, yep. it's, I don't know other than proper, um, uh, education. I don't really know another way around it. I, I had a conversation with a young, Chef de Cuisine, just uh, just last week, he was asking me, he's like, I really wish that my my managers and my the owner would teach me more about management. And I'm like, well, who taught you how to make pâté en croûte, as an example? Mm -hmm. He said, because I said, because it's not on your menu. Who taught you how to make it? He's like, well, nobody taught me how to make it. I looked in a book, I read the recipe, and then I, and then I figured it out. And I said, well, you have to take that that same sort of um, thought process when you when you when you're trying to be a manager as well. It's like read some books about management styles, read some, yeah. read some, you know, teach yourself how to become a better manager and become the mentor that you wish you had. Mm -hmm. If more people took more ownership of that, then the industry would be much better as opposed to just sitting back and complaining about it. Uh, absolutely. And, and, but you, you're a bit unique because a lot of people do just that they do complain about it and they do nothing. You've actually taken a massive initiative, um, you know, with a collective of other people. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about cook's camp. Yeah. So could you tell our listeners uh, a little bit more about what cook's camp is and how it originated? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of facets to the question, but basically our industry, the, the, the food industry, the hospitality industry has been broken for a long time. And there's a lot of different reasons for it. And nobody's going to make it. Nobody's going to come from outside and make our industry better. And that's like the government's not going to come in and do it. You know, you know, fast food chains aren't going to come and make it better. You know, big restaurant chains like Girls or Taxi Club, they're not going to come in and make it better either. So it's up to the individuals within our industry to step up and try to take the reins of what's going on and actually try to make it better. And there are a lot of people across the country who are doing that, not, not just Canada, but in the US as well. And they're really trying to make it better for everybody. Mm. And I just want to do my part. Like I have a, that's just part of my work ethic is if I, if I don't know, if I, if I see a problem, I just want to try to figure out a way to help make it better. Mm. Uh, I, I know I can't fix it, but I, I definitely want to make it better for not just myself and my, my team, but for, the next generations of cooks down the road. And that was sort of the impetus of, of cook's camp. It was, you know, 
I've been in this industry for 25 years and I've seen lots of different types of com- like cooking conferences and, and it's always about the, the latest technique and the, and the, the, you know, it's Fran Adria coming and he's doing the, the latest cool technique or, you know, it's, I, I, there's a million different things like, mm. you know, there's terroir, there's star chefs, there's all these different things, but not one of them has ever been about how to become a better person and a better employee and a better manager and a better chef. Mm. It's always about just the latest this and the latest equipment and all that sort of stuff. So we, we decided that Cook's Camp was going to be about, you know, business development and social media awareness and uh, how to be better in social media and how to market yourself better. The la- it, it's like how to publish a cookbook and how to be a better um, mentor, what it means to, to what is what is the idea of work-life balance? And for Cooks Camp 2022, we're going to have things like yoga and Pilates and um, classes on nutrition and, and knowing how to, where your food comes from and things like that. It's, it's giving yourself knowledge to be a better chef, better manager, a better owner, uh, a better cook. And th- th- when we do that, that's sort of personal development. The, the, it, 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 it raises all the boats mm. idea, you know, everybody gets yep. better. So the yep. industry gets better. And that's the idea behind cook's camp. And to me, I, it's such a fantastic initiative. And to me, it's equal parts shocking that nothing like this exists, right? That like yeah. it took this long for something. These these are very sort of basic resources for an absolutely enormous workforce across the, yeah. the world and across North America. So, you know, it's it's just such a such a fantastic initiative. Where what what can people do to sign up, or where can they go to get involved with Cooks Camp and the great work you're doing? You, you actually, I know you just did recently the virtual one, but I yeah. know you're now doing registrations for the in person. So maybe tell us a bit about how they can find that. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, we we are we just did it last Wednesday it was co- the virtual Cooks Camp 2021. We are um, if you go to cookscamp.ca and you can sign up and buy tickets for uh, Cooks Camp 2022. Uh, it's going to be a two day event in uh, Pemberton, British Columbia. Mm. Uh, it's at North Arm Farm, which is just at the foot of Mount Curry. It's one of the most beautiful, picturesque farms probably in British Columbia. Um, we haven't sussed out all the activations that are going to happen exa- there yet, but uh, we'll have the whole full roster of what's going to be going hopefully by December where that's what we're shooting for, trying to get everybody confirmed. It's still difficult because of COVID and things, but there's an underlying reason why we're doing cooks camp. And I don't, I don't know if you know this or not Drew, but there, one of the reasons what we want to bring 500 to 700 people of hospitality people from across North America to cooks camp 2022. Mm. And the, the idea is through this, through the, the sale of the tickets is just basically you put the event on yeah, and all the food and the, the drinks and everything is sort of, it's included in the price of the, of the ticket. But what we're leveraging is everybody there is it's going to allow us to, to find sponsorship through different um, companies that are related to the hospitality business. And we're trying to raise a hundred thousand dollars as seed money for the chef's table society culinary library and resource center mm. it's an actual brick a brick and mortar culinary library that would be an event space and uh resource for all people in the hospitality industry who come to vancouver or who live in vancouver and it's it's a there's a bunch of stuff on the website about it but it's a it's a, a multifaceted place and it's a long-term project that uh, we want to last for generations and uh yeah, we're looking for people to help with that and to you know make it come to fruition. I mean, the thing is, we're a bunch of cooks who can run a restaurant and run a line, but building a library—that's a whole new, a whole new uh, set of problems. Wow, I, I didn't know that, Robert. That's a that's yeah. absolutely incredible that that is the ultimate end goal. I mean, one of the things that I've always admired about you and especially the people that are here is you, you just have these massive dreams and you actually are yeah. taking steps to achieve them. And it's so admirable. So, you know, I encourage all of our all of our listeners to to check out Cook's Camp. We had the website uh, right up there, cookscamp.ca. Um, support this amazing initiative how, however you can, whether that's attending or with a donation. Um, you know, feel free to join that and let us know in the comments here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you referenced the change that you've seen. You've been here 25 years in the industry. Yeah. So in that time, in your opinion, 
how has the industry evolved during that time? And where, where, like, where do you see this going in the future? That's a very good question. And it's not an easy one because it's such a big question. Yeah. I mean, per- personally, I mean, when I first started cooking, the idea was you stayed at a restaurant for a couple of years. And that way you, you were able to work through the seniority of the restaurant from a chef to party to a sous chef. And then you also worked the menu f- through the season. So you saw all the recipes that the chef had through the first season. And then you were able to teach a new person the second year, all those recipes that you learned the year before. Nowadays, you're lucky to get six months out of a person at, at a restaurant, which is, there's a, there's a cultural shift that's happened in the, in, in just in general, I think. And it's, it's definitely hit the restaurant business is that this is this idea that, um, People want change all the time and mm. they want to be, you know, challenged. I don't know if it's challenged is not the right word. I think it's just that they like to see new things all the time. And I don't mm. know if it's our social media culture, like always having to see something new or, or they just mm. don't understand the idea of building something that's much bigger than themselves or, or being mm. part of something that's bigger mm. than just one person. And I think that's the, that's the biggest part of it. And I, and it's not, it's, there's, it's not like this, it's a bad thing. Like, people always give millennials or the Gen Zs a, a, a bad rap. And I don't think that that's fair. I think that the, every generation is different and I'm much different than my father's generation. And I'm sure you are to your father's it's, it's, it's just the times have changed and, and the hospitality industry needs to change with it to, mm. to stay relevant and to stay, and to stay um, strong. You know, Robert Clark at, at Cook's camp, he talked about mentorship and he talked about the idea of, the sustainability of the profession. And I, it, it hit home because there's a lot of cooks nowadays that don't know how to cook and mm. uh, they don't know how to make simple things like a mayonnaise or a hollandaise sauce or how to sear a steak properly or where a ribeye comes from on a cow. Like they don't understand those things. And that, that aspect of our profession is being lost and it's really unfortunate. And that's why I do what I can to make sure that that doesn't, that that doesn't uh, happen and I teach my cooks the, to to make sure that they understand why they cook and and the importance of it and where you know why things do, are the way they are. Um, but it's it's a it's difficult when the the majority of restaurants out there are you know only seeking the bottom line. I guess. Mm. Yeah. And and you know I I would be remiss to ask you about this this situation it's happening right now and I'm sure you're you're understanding from every chef that's out there looking for cooks looking for servers looking for everyone massive hospitality shortage happening right now in the industry and it's a yeah. it's a, it's a big problem combination of factors and part of it's pandemic driven but you know again a big part of it is like you mentioned those young people just are not really that excited by the idea of going to cook at a restaurant anymore. And, and yeah. maybe they're scared off by some of this stuff they're seeing that you and I are talking about now from the past. Yeah. So, you know, I, I guess my question is, you know, to, from, from your angle, from your, what would your advice be to a young person who's interested in cooking, but is perhaps a little bit scared about entering a, a, a you know, a re- industry that has a reputation for being toxic? Well, I mean, the number one thing is, is it's about where you work. That's mm. the number one thing. And, we do something called stages and it's just basically you go around to different restaurants and you, and you get to, you should eat at different restaurants, see what kind of food they're doing, find out what interests you and then try to spend a day in the kitchen. And it's for free. And the reason why you do that is to sort of make sure that you, you understand what the restaurant's about and you get along with the people who work there and that you like that the environment that that's there, like you can't go and, like if a restaurant's toxic and the chef's throwing pots and pans and then, and um, you know, is swearing at everybody and being a misogynist and all that sort of bad stuff that you hear about, and you see that on your stage and expect it to be different when you work there, that's not gonna that's not gonna happen. You shouldn't work at a place like that. Mm. Um, so, spending the extra time to try to find try to find those places that that is super important. Um, and then you know, supporting those places that do it the right way. Um, is also super important too. I think one of the things that we've talked about a lot in my podcast is this idea that the professional kitchen or, or being a professional cook is it's it's one of those it's one of those professions where it doesn't get the recognition that it deserves because anybody thinks they could be a cook. Um, 
because they cook at home or they, they can just go find something cheaper somewhere else or whatever. They don't, mm-hmm. there's not a val- There's not, it's not like there's value added to it. And, and that's, uh, it's super unfortunate. And the only way to make it better is to just support those restaurants that are doing it the right way. Um, and Vancouver has, we're very lucky here in Vancouver. We have a lot of really good, small independent restaurants that do everything they can to source local and, and cook properly and, and do it the right way. And, um, you know, it's, it's, those are the, those are the places you should support as a cook, but also as a, as a patron as well. Mm-hmm. And, and I want to talk a little bit too, about you reference your own podcast. You have the Mise en Plus podcast. Tell us a little bit about uh, that show and, and sort of what, what, what your main goal is for your listeners. Yeah. So the podcast was started um, by myself and Andre LeRivier to talk. It was a precursor to Cook's Camp. Actually, the, the original Cook's Camp got canceled in 2020 because of COVID. It was the in-person event. And it was start. It started in January. So just before COVID hit and all the podcasts leading up to it were sort of taste of what was going to happen at Cook's Camp. And then it continued and we started, we changed our focus to try to, um, then come up with solutions, uh, or I should say, we, we talked about the, some of the problems that were uh, of our of our industry, and then and then in the season two, we decided to, to come up with actual solutions. Um, so, you know, the stuff like living wage, the the no tipping policy, um, the brigade system, um, lots of different things that people are talking about now, and trying to come up with real world solutions by people who are actually doing it. Chefs or restaurant owners who are actually changing the way things are and talking to them and giving people sort of a roadmap on how to, uh, on mm-hmm. how to fix it in their own place. And it's not going to change. People are going to change overnight, but anything we can do to sort of to help it along, yeah. um, we're going to do it. Yeah. And getting people talking about it is, is, is part half the battle, right? Like uh, getting people to acknowledge that uh, a problem exists at, every every fabric of this of this sort of culture is is super important and yeah. uh, encourage all of our listeners here to check out this podcast if you like the conversations we have here on the wellness hub you're going to love this podcast as well so please please check that out and uh Thank robert you. i want to i want to do a i want to sort of break the ice here and do a little bit of a lightning round that i prepared here for you i hope you're ready <laughs> to, so th- 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 we like to ask uh sort of these related questions to our guests these are going to start really easy and they're going to get progressively slightly difficult. Okay. So are you, okay. are you ready to go? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Cat person or dog person? Both. Wow. Okay. Coffee or tea? Uh, coffee for sure. American or French style omelet? Uh, French. Okay. Would you rather give up cheese forever or give up chocolate forever? Oh man, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a horrible question. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't live with either. That's 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 no. That's not. That's yeah. Neither. Sorry. You're passing on that. Is that a yeah, pass? yeah. Oh, oh, okay. That's the first pass we've had here on the wellness app. Okay. Uh, ravioli or dumplings? Oh, I would say the same thing, but I would say I, I'd much rather. Eat, there's more variety of dumplings than there are. Yeah, that's great. Great that. answer. Very technical. Uh, grilled cheese <laughs> or mac and cheese? Grilled cheese for sure. Fries or mashed potatoes? If the fries are cooked in horse fat, French fries. Wow, that is a very specific answer. I love it. You're, you're fa- okay. Uh, uh, night, night out or night in? What kind of guy are you? My favorite thing in the world to do is to sit at a table with friends, at a great restaurant, um, having an amazing meal, drinking a bottle of wine with a great conversation. Uh, that's one of my bar none favorite things to do. But if I have to do it at home, that's fine too. Do you have a favorite beer? Uh, yes, Fuller's ESB. Great. Great choice. Your favorite burger in Vancouver? Well, it's the Monarch Burger, but uh, it's not available right now. <laughs> I should have uh, anticipated that. Yeah, that's a tough one. Put peanut uh, burger, I guess. Oh, sorry, what was the answer? The the well, actually, between two buns makes a really good burger. Oh, nice one, nice yeah, one. Yeah. And maybe a difficult question: your go-to absolute favorite kitchen tool? Oh, a spoon. I, Just I, a plain old spoon. Yeah, a tablespoon. I have. I've, I've been cooking with the same tablespoon for twenty years, and I've. I use it to from for everything, for taking stuff off the cutting board, to stirring, to flipping a piece of fish, to basting a steak. Yeah, I use it for everything. 
The spoon. The basics, people. The basics. Yeah, yeah. basics. So, so important. Get yourself a good spoon and hold on to it for 25 years. That's the <laughs> lesson. That, that's the takeaway. Thank you. That That's that's it. You did a great job. Very okay, well thought good. out answers. Um, we've got some questions now coming in from social media. I'm going to throw to a couple of these questions. So yep. this is from Cassandra from Instagram. What was your favorite restaurant that you cooked at or owned? It's like that picking was, that, one of your children. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a real hard one. One of the ones that I wish people got or understood better was uh, Fat Dragon. It was a restaurant that I had for one year. I opened it. It's um, It was in East Van, Deep East Van, where actually a restaurant, the Sanko, is now. Mm. And uh, it was a it was an Asian-style barbecue restaurant. And it was um, the food was amazing. And uh, I wish people understood it, but no one ever went. So mm. it was close. <laughs> mm. So that that was your choice, yeah. Great yeah. choice. I ate there. I ate there several times actually, oh, really? and I I absolutely loved it. Yeah, I ate there several times, and then I was very sad when when it closed. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Me too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I've got it. This is a really good question coming in from Instagram. What can we do? And I'm assuming they mean patrons uh, to find out if the restaurant has a good work culture in order to support it. Oh, that's a great question. Um... Well, one of the easiest ways, and I and I've been noticing this at a, 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 a in a small number of restaurants lately, is that it says on the on the on the menu that you, that no tipping is needed or tipping is included in the price, and that the the the, the they're paying a living wage. Um, mm. That's a very simple one. Like there's a there's a brewery in Port Coquitlam called Patina, yeah, Patina, and they're a barbecue restaurant and and a brewery, and they serve they. They pay a living wage and there's no tipping is required. And it's some of the best service I've had in the lower mainland in 20 years. It's, wow. a, it's absolutely amazing. And the beer is great and the barbecue is really good. And um, so when you see th stuff like that, do everything you can to support it because it's very, very difficult for the ownership to do that because uh, it goes against all the norms. And But it's really, really worthwhile. Mm. Great, great suggestion and great advice uh, for people that want to check that out. Look for those little things, those symbols on the menu that reference the staff. Great, absolutely great advice. Another one coming in from YouTube. This is a great question. Your favorite and least favorite dish to prepare? Actually, we were talking about this. My sister sent me a picture <laughs> of a squash this morning. She's like, how do I cook this? And I said, well, you just take it to the bin and you and you just throw it away. <laughs> a squash. I hate squash. I, really? I like all squash? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, pretty much. I mean, like I'm like my dad that way, actually. Squash. Like they're starting to, to happen now because it's coming to the fall, and so squash. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that you shouldn't really be eating until next year, like February. And you know, they're better after they've been they've been. Mm. Um, uh, stored for a little while anyway. You shouldn't eat them. There's still so much great summer bounty around. There's still tomatoes. There's great wild mushrooms right now. There's still great corn and, and things like that. So um, I wait on the squash until next year. Uh, so that's my least favorite. My I don't have a favorite, but I do have a favorite month, and it's September. It's my favorite month to cook, and it's for those reasons. It's because wow. wild mushrooms. There's tomatoes. There's corn. There's, you know, all the great stuff, salmon, um, you know, it's, it's an amazing month to cook in BC. Uh, and, it, you know, the stone fruit is out and, oh, it's, there's beginning of August, there's still strawberries. Oh, it's the best. Yeah. This, and we're in it. We're in it. We got a, week, a week, little over a week left, right? We yeah. got to savor every moment till, yeah. uh, till, till it's, till it's squash all day, every day. <laughs> squash <laughs> squash apples and quince. <laughs> yeah. That's all fall. Yeah. yeah. I, another one coming in here from Instagram. Uh, probably another tough question. Your personal top three restaurants to eat at in the city. That's a, that's a, that is a tough one because there's a lot of great restaurants. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't. I, man. Depends on what I'm. There's I, there's. I have so many more than three, but Burdock and Co. I think Andrea Carlson is one of the most underrated chefs ever in the history of food. Um, mm. And her Burdock and Co. is is my favorite restaurant in Vancouver when it comes mm. to like real local hyper local farm to table food. Then Maynam Angus Ann's restaurant mm -hmm. is the best Thai food I've ever had. Uh, it's absolutely delicious no matter what time of the day I eat there uh, or day of the week, I should say. Um, another great one is Desanko. My son and I mm. go to Desanko all the time. Uh, they had a cold uh, uh, ramen noodle salad that was just unbelievable. And they have this beef belly tonkatsu that's just yeah, in your mouth. it's so good. Uh, I would say those are probably the my three go to, or that I would tell people to, if they were coming in from out of town to go to for sure. 
Great picks. Absolutely yeah. great, great picks. Um, I want to touch on something that we talked about a little bit earlier, and that's finding that time to unwind, that mental health, that balance, right? What yeah. I'd love for you to share with our listeners, what do you do when you need to, to, to unwind and relax? Um, I would work. Really? I, I, yeah, oh, wow. Yeah, I, I do a lot of woodworking and I've done it for a long time and it's, it's a hobby of mine and I've done it a lot more v through COVID um, than any other time in my life because I've had the time and the, and the opportunity to do it. But it's, it's finding a hobby that you can, that you love to do and um, it keeps you active, like it keeps you moving around and, and keeps your brain sharp. Like that's super important. Um, but yeah, mine is, mine's woodworking. So like most of the furniture in my apartment I've made and I, I make what? furniture all the time. So, oh my yeah. God. What is your, what is your most ambitious woodworking project to date? It's what I'm working on. I'm actually working on it right now. I'm, I'm building a new bar sort of bar setup thing and it's, it's crazy and it's taking forever. And I, I love it because it's super technical and there's done a ton of materials that I've never utilized before. And veneers and i'm using walnut uh mm -hmm. black walnut wood and it's it's super cool it's a lot of fun and i can't wait to to post it but this like this chandelier that's right there i mm -hmm. made that earlier this you, year you you made the chandelier is it yeah the, wow it's hard to see but it's a it's it's actually made from a piece of reclaimed timber that i had at campagnolo that was um we used to hold casks a, a, a cast of negroni up on like on the shelf on the wall in the bar and when we sold campagnolo i took the shelf down took the wood because it's such a beautiful old 100 year old fir um wood that came from a barn uh the out in mission so I took the wood and then made that <laughs> wow yeah. Wow. It has found new life. I'm amazing. I hope yeah. to see, I hope to unearth you, your secret uh, woodworking Instagram account, or I, I don't know if it, it exists. We didn't go deep enough, I guess, in our research. It, but, does, it uh, does exist. It does no exist. way. It, oh, yeah. no way. But can, can we throw, I would love to see it. What, what is the, what is the it's, account? It's, it's Robert Belcham Designs. Robert Belcham Designs. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Instagram yeah. people look it up. Amazing. Uh, one, one more question will sneak in here from the audience is coming in from Instagram. I think I know the answer to this. Do you like pickling? And if so, <laughs> what do you recommend this season? Absolutely. Pickling is uh, super important. Um, pickle it all. Pickle everything. Um, pickle everything. Um, we did, uh, uh, we did what we, at the restaurant for a, for, for Campanula's entire existence, we did something we called it homesteading. It's basically, we took with the bounty of the summer and we preserved it to be able to utilize in the, in the deep winter. And uh, so we pickled so much stuff. We processed and froze so many fruits and vegetables. So we had that local food that we could use next January, February, March, April, all the way up into June is when the first of the the, the stinging nettles are the, usually the first things that happen uh, mm. locally uh, fresh uh, that are fresh and green. And so you have, you know, a good four or five months of, of sort of relying on produce coming from California or, or just eating squash. And, uh, and, you know, you know how I feel about squash. <laughs> so yeah, pickling gets you through that squash season and, you know, that's, it gets, that's... it's very important for your, for you personally. Yes. Um, and we, I saw we, the, our, our behind the scenes team, we got the, we got the Robert Belcham designs there up the Instagram designs oh, yeah. up on there. <laughs> Great work behind the scenes there team. Good hustle. No, no um, I want to, I would love to know Robert. I really loved our conversation tonight. I'd love to know where, where should we go besides your, your woodworking account? Where should we go to learn more about, about you and the great work you're involved in all your projects? Uh, well, the, the two restaurants, Popina uh, and Popina Cantina, they're both on Granville Island. So please come and patronize those two and support, uh, support those local restaurants. Um, do what you can uh, for Cook's Camp, the Chef's Table Society. Um, and uh, yeah, just the, the, the biggest thing I hope that people take away from our conversation tonight is, is you know, support that local mom and pop restaurant because uh, it's without that support from you, um, they're not going to be around forever. And, and that's, that's bad for you. It's bad for the city and it's bad for, for cooks and hospitality people across Canada. 
Amazing, uh, amazing point to, to end our conversation on, Robert. Uh, I really appreciate you making the time. I know you're a busy guy with all your projects to hop on, hang out with us tonight, have this important conversation. So uh, thank you again for your time. We really hope you'll come back and join us again in the not too distant future. Drew, the pleasure was really mine. Thank you very much. The questions were awesome. And uh, I would love to come back and chat anytime you'd like to. Thanks, Robert. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, that, that was awesome. I just want to give, again, a huge thank you to Robert for taking time out of his super busy schedule to stop by the Wellness Hub, share all of his amazing insights and his experience with us. You know, I hope today's episode was illuminating for you. Robert is incredibly well-respected in the local culinary scene, precisely because, as you can tell, he's so passionate about evolving the industry. His generosity when it comes to mentorship, devoting his time to educating young chefs is just truly incredible. And beyond that, his advocacy work as it pertains to the hospitality industry is really nothing short of inspiring. And it was such a genuine pleasure getting to talk to Robert today. And I sincerely hope that his conversation tonight with me was able to provide you with inspiration or knowledge that you can truly take with you and have actionable results. So it's really no surprise to me after talking to him that throughout his career, he's been considered a pioneer for constantly rethinking the way things could be done in service of both the industry and also the people within it. And I think the defining trait of someone like that is an unwillingness to accept the status quo. It's a desire to constantly grow, to improve and question the way that things are being done. That attitude of never settling, always looking to push the envelope. It's really a testament to both Robert's abilities as a chef and a restaurateur and a leader. And look, pretty much all of us have restaurants as a part of our lives. Many of us who've worked in restaurants, we know what needs to be changed and we know what's not working, but it takes a tremendous amount of courage to step up and actually help usher in that change. Robert's career and his legacy speaks for itself, but the industry is more lucky to have chefs like him bucking the status quo, making real actionable change in an industry that so badly needs it. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. If you'd like to see more great conversations like this, please remember, like, comment, subscribe, follow us on YouTube, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, at Upmeals. We will see you next Wednesday evening right here on the Wellness Hub for another great conversation. Until then, I'm Drew Monroe.